You're listening to Frontlines, a podcast for the people that truly make mountain biking happen. Not the riders, racers, or product designers, but the builders, advocates, and the often forgotten board members of your local mountain bike trail association. When it comes to the topics of this podcast, I've made a conscious effort to not discuss the actual mountain bike itself. No conversations about wheel size or suspension preferences, and I've done this for a reason. The first, mountain bike media is super saturated in this content. But the second is because, frankly, it doesn't interest me personally. I'm not a good bike industry representative. I've been riding the same bike for four years with absolutely no plans of upgrading. And I couldn't even tell you which tires I'm running right now. I think my front was saved from a friend's recycling pile. The latest and greatest bikes and tech just doesn't interest me. And I seem to be frequenting mountain bike news websites less and less. One of the main reasons I started this podcast was because I couldn't find the mountain bike show that I wanted to listen to. But every now and then, someone shares an article with me that reminds me that I'm not alone. Every once in a while, I get to read or listen to a thoughtful piece on advocacy, community, or social impact. When it comes to mountain biking, we have bigger concerns than plus size tires or 29er DH bikes. I'm your host, Brent Hillier, and this is episode 18 of Frontlines. Before we get into this episode's main topic, I want to share some feedback concerning last episode. I spoke with Brandon Pack of the Ozark Off-Road Cyclists out in Arkansas. They've been heavily focused on increasing tourism into their region, and he touched on a point that Jeff McNamee of the Salem Area Trail Alliance made. Last episode, Jeff said that riders don't ride wet trails maliciously. They show up in the parking lot on their day off, and he can empathize with the fact that it's hard to turn around. Jay Darby of MTB Co. out in Kelowna spoke very candidly about riding wet trails out in Vernon while on vacation one year. And this is a challenge when a community starts to promote their trails as a riding destination. It's going to rain at some point, and you can't expect tourists who have made the effort of traveling somewhere, booking a hotel, and forking out a good amount of money to just not ride the trails. So the OORC and Brannon have decided to create wet weather friendly routes. These routes will be posted on signboards in the parking lots, as well as posted online. I think it's a great solution to a potential problem. Next episode, you'll be hearing my full interview with Brannon Pack, so look out for that. One other item I saw this week was pointed out to me during a conversation I had with the RVA Moore president, Greg Rollins. Greg's club is in Richmond, Virginia area, and they work alongside a multi-user group Friends of Pocahontas State Park, maintaining and advocating trails in that state park. This group has created an automated system using a weather tracking website. When it rains a certain amount in the area, the trails are automatically closed on their website and text alerts are even sent out to anyone interested in subscribing to them. The trails are then automatically reopened 24 hours after it stopped raining. It's a cool system and a great use of technology and potentially something that could be integrated into trail forks in the future. If your club does something that you'd like to share with the Frontlines community, then please reach out and let me know. But without any further delay, let's get on with the main discussion of this episode. My guest is Devin O'Neill. He's a writer for Bike Magazine. At the end of March, Bike launched a four-part series called Lines in the Dirt. Devin explored three different communities with three very different access problems. It was a refreshing topic for mountain bike media to cover. But what was really amazing was the depth that Devin went to tell each story. I highly recommend reading them. You can find a link to them in the show notes. Hi, Devin. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Brent. Thanks for having me. First off, what was the inspiration for writing uh, this series of articles? Bike puts out a call for uh, story ideas every year, every spring. And I really felt like there was an opportunity to look into the wilderness issue with a really hyper local lens and so i kind of pitched that i looked around for some places that would be quote unquote ground zero and i really wanted to identify the characters and get to know them a little bit more and you know i feel like a lot of the access coverage is often 
this thousand foot view and you come away just kind of bogged down by the policy discussion um, without really knowing. I mean, it still comes down to who in each community is on each side. And uh, so I pitched this idea um, strictly looking at wilderness and, and uh, my editor there, Nicole Formosa, came back to me and was like, you know, we like this, but we'd like to expand it to look at access as a whole um, across the entire United States and, uh, you know, really figure out probably three places to, to really zoom in on and do that hyper local thing. And so I spent a couple months, you know, kind of vetting a lot of places. I talked to a bunch of people in, in a bunch of different States that have some access issues and, uh, found three that I really thought would depict this issue well. And, um, you know, we wanted a federal land kind of epicenter and that's Montana. Um, we wanted some history involved and that, that was certainly Marin County, California, and uh, then we wanted something even more local than than federal. And so we found this uh, state watershed in central Massachusetts that was really local, but involved, you know, state government officials. And uh, and that was the last episode in the series. Yeah. And I, the, the whole thing did a great job of highlighting that none of these situations are the same. And uh, that every land dispute that's out there is a little bit different. And, and, you know, a lot of people right now are focused on the wilderness, which is a, which is a huge topic and, and, uh, you know, a big issue, but there are land disputes um, that, that look very different than that. And I think, I think you did a great job with, with kind of diving into three very distinct locales, which was really cool. Thanks. You know, I should add to another really big goal with this series was we wanted to root it in facts. And so, you know, not uh, have opinions um, for me as the writer. We just wanted to present a bunch of facts and have the readers be able to decide for themselves. No matter, I mean, I hope that people on both sides of each issue have read this series and uh, really considered a little more deeply than they have in the past you know, where the other side's coming from and, and why their rationale is the way it is. And facts do that better than than anything. So that was another uh, kind of big aim with the series as a whole. Mm. Yeah. And, and actually there was one of one of the people that you interviewed, it was a, a woman out in Marin County. And, and she said uh, that that mountain bikers are not just one group. And, and I, I thought it was interesting that I was all of a sudden I was kind of agreeing with with kind of uh, someone that you would you might describe as an anti biker type person. Mm-hmm. But I, I thought she had a great point there. If you you know, if you look at their job and really consider their job as advocates for the other side. Um, and I think you're referring to Nona Dennis, mm-hmm. or if you look at a land manager's job and really consider what they're weighing, you come away with a, a little different perspective than you do when you stay kind of rooted in, in your instinctive position. And there's not, there's nothing wrong with your instinctive position. You know, that's why you feel the way you feel, but that was another goal. You know, I, I really wanted to give a voice to both sides and, you know, of course, we didn't get the same level of cooperation from, say, the anti-mountain bikers for some of the locales that we uh, focused on. But, yeah, that was I'm glad that you saw that because I thought she made a good point, too. And this was something that, you know, as you analyze this whole access issue, it's something that kept coming up. And it's like, gosh, well, the ones who are jerks on the trail are really hurting everyone else who goes way out of their way to be nice and take care of the trails for free in their own time and, you know, does all these things. And, uh, and some people go really fast and some people don't go fast. And some people like to ride above 10,000 feet and some people want to ride from their front door and, you know, they have a half hour to spare each day. And, uh, you know, these are vast differences in what people want out of mountain biking and how they go about getting it. And the impacts that those kind of strategies or, or viewpoints have on other user groups, they're hugely different. And yet they're all um, kind of associated with one sport, and that's mountain biking. So that was a, a key thing to, to try and um, get to the bottom of a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I've always felt that, you know, if if just every single mountain biker just had better manners, and, and a lot of us do, but if everyone had better manners and just stopped and yielded to hikers and equestrians and said good morning or, or thank you or have a nice day, that, that we'd have fewer anti-mountain bike advocates out there. And and it, it seems to be that 
there's just certain riders that are really empowering and, and really getting these advocates to stand up and fight against mountain bikes. And yeah, you're absolutely right. And that's an, there is never, that probably will never change, mm -hmm. you know, the, but the same can be said about every other user group. You know, there, let's say there are 5% of mountain bikers who are just complete asses. There are 5% of hikers who, you know, are complete asses. <laughs> there are 5% of equestrians that are complete, 5% of dirt bikers, you know, I mean, for the most part, we're kind of looking at society as a whole. And once you start generalizing, according to how people are getting around on their recreation, you know, you're kind of losing sight that, Hey, we're all the same species. And yeah, some of us like to do this, go fast, go slow, whatever, but don't forget, we all come with the same instincts and, and, uh, you know, we all want, I mean, heck, if everyone's being really honest, we're all NIMBYs. We all want, you know, trails to ourselves and, and, uh, you know, solitude and peace to ourselves. You know, I don't know. It, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, cancel out any other user groups when people say mountain bikers ruin it. Yeah. Yeah, and in part two, you had uh, someone that that you referred to as as A Train, and and you hid their identity, you disguised their voice in the video that was in the article, and and A Train rides trails that they're not supposed to, uh, but they believe that that they're helping, and the words that they use was it's a bit of civil disobedience, and and uh, you know I think a lot of ag advocates are you know when they see that video or they read that part of the article was like this is this is the this is the problem. You know, that there's this small minority of riders that, that just aren't cooperating and we're, we're trying to work and trying to put our best foot forward. Yet there's, there's a handful of riders out there that are continuing to, um, challenge and to, to continue to be problems. Yep. And, uh, you know, the funny thing, Brent, if you look at the com in the comments section at the bottom of that story, there's quite a little discussion about A-Train and one of the most classic <laughs> comments of this whole series and the series generated a lot of them was A-Train, I want to buy you a beer. And that was it. That was all <laughs> the guy said. And then the next guy, of course, said something, you know, kind of, uh, in response to that. But, um, I just thought it was funny, you know, very few people can really identify with, with, uh, how A-Train carries out his feelings on the access issue, but so many people can identify to those feelings, yeah. you know, to feeling like they've been for whatever reason, had their civil rights kind of taken away a little bit. And, and he, I thought, you know, a train was one of the first sources that I found in Northern California who really, who was like, made me want to focus there. You know, when I was doing the vetting of the different locations, I, I actually got in touch with him and, uh, you know, he, he only wanted to talk if, if, uh, no one knew who he was. And I, I thought that was fair because I thought it was really important to give voice to someone who goes about it the way he does, because that's part of this whole equation. Yes. You could make a very clear argument. I would stand right by it too, that he hurts the access ish, you know, the access stance for mountain bikers. And yet a train has done everything in his power to change the system. He's gone to congressional meetings, sat through a bunch of stuff that he didn't want to sit through, written letters, had conversations. Everyone told him it would be political suicide for them to try and uh, stand by him, you know, when push came to shove. And so he said, okay, I'm not really doing any harm out there. We take care of these trails. I'm going to keep riding them. And there are a bunch of other guys that do too. And, uh, you know, you can see both sides. That's all I'll say on that one. You know, you really can. Uh, you spoke with uh, John Burke, the CEO and and owner of of Trek, and and the conversation that that you had with him was was interesting. He said that he never considered how Trek's advertisement influences access uh, until uh, he was interviewed for this story. And so one of the one of the things that was brought up was, you know, if videos and photos show riders, you know, shredding trails and 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 roosting things, you know, how can we explain to land managers and anti-mountain bike advocates with a straight face that mountain biking is, is low impact. And, and John said that he had never really thought about that until you had, you had spoke with him. And I kind of find that a little crazy. And I was, I was kind of thinking like, is he being honest there or is that? I, is I, I thought he was being perfectly honest and I really appreciated his candor. You know, I don't think he should be taken a task for not having considered that, you know, the, as I tried to explain, or, or show at least, I guess, in that first article that you're talking about of the series was, th you know, this is a lot more complicated than just, uh, 
hey, you know, we can't do this because it might impact access somewhere where we may or may not have, you know, business interests. You're asking these big companies who are intent on making money, you know, bottom lines obviously drive businesses for the most part. And uh, you're asking them to not essentially not make as much money by not promoting their brand the way that they feel gives them the best chance to make money. So it's not a very easy thing. And, and for him to to say that, I don't think, you know, was, uh, I don't know, any kind of like indictment on how he's done his business. I just, I actually was really refreshed that he was like, okay, actually, I'm going to go talk to my guys about this, you know? Yeah. And because uh, so, you want to find a fine line, you know, obviously he's still trying to sell bikes and understandably so, but um, he's pretty conscious when it comes to access much more so than, I mean, a lot of the bike companies that I, I went through their PR departments, you know, people were like, okay, we're going to get you this interview. And then I literally never heard back from them when I was try trying to talk to the CEOs of other big bike companies. And I think it's because it's, it's this really delicate issue and, and, you know, kind of a no comment or no, no acknowledgement is almost um, safer uh, when it comes to the capitalist side of this. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it, it, um, it, it kind of, it reminded me that as, as a trail advocate, as somebody who, who does a lot of volunteer work and who gets out and builds and, and maintains the trails in, in my local community, that, that educating the public is, is always a challenge, but we've got a long way to go. And, and I think even educating the industry that, that is in the bike industry, but might not be necessarily as, as, uh, involved in the advocacy world. There's, there's still a long way that we have to go to kind of help people understand that, you know, this, this fight continues and, uh, and that there's some places that are really threatened as far as trail access goes. Yep. Yeah, there are. So kind of focusing on the, the Montana side of things and, and, and really diving into that, that, um, wilderness access and, and that conversation that's been happening. Uh, there was a great quote from, from Eric Melson. He's the advocacy manager of, of IMBA. And he said, the world is run by those who show up. And, uh, and I really like that, you know, it, it kind of put things down to like, they were there, um, they're showing up they're they're fighting for access, which is, which is, um, something that's really needed. Uh, one of the examples of that, that, that you discussed was, was the Bitterroot backcountry cyclists. And, and a few episodes ago, I actually spoke with, with Lance, the, the president of that club. And, and we, we, we discussed this kind of not on the recording, but on the side. And it's an, it's something that I'd like to explore more in an episode, but, they're the first uh, mountain bike group to sue the Forest Service for access. And that seems crazy. <laughs> that seems like a huge escalation to suddenly actually get down and sue the Forest Service for access. Well, you know, uh, what other choice do they have? Mm. They have no other choice. They've played by the rules. You know, they drove to meetings, took time off from their lives, did all this stuff and wrote letters and really presented a, a sound rationale. I think that if you looked at this objectively, no matter what side you were on, I think their rationale was pretty sound. And uh, they just didn't see any other option. It was either accept that they were banned for their, from their favorite trails, basically for the rest of their lives, because the next forest plan or, or travel management plan likely will not happen while they're still riding mountain bikes, or sue. And unfortunately for them, they did not have the capital to sue on their own. So they had to join uh, a bunch of motorized groups and, you know, a lot being part of a lawsuit is better than not. And that's what they decided. But, you know, I think that they felt like they had a, a strong enough case to stand on their own. And yet, you know, the finances involved, these are, you think, uh, it's not, it's no coincidence. Don't be surprised that this is the first lawsuit by a mountain bike advocacy group, uh, suing for access. You know, this is, uh, <laughs> this is a world that, doesn't have a lot of money. You know, if you look at a, a wilderness advocacy group, their budgets are in the multiple millions per year, you know, for these mountain bikers to scrape together 50 grand or a hundred grand, th that is an enormous proposition. So that is the principal difference. And that's the principal reason why lawsuits from the mountain bike side aren't brought more often. And everyone involved knows that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're a small group, but they, they lost a lot of trails and it's a small town even there. And, and it, I think he, he mentioned something like 160 miles of, of single track, 178 miles, 178. Yep. They lost it all. Uh, you know, they've lost access to that. That's, that's crazy. I couldn't imagine losing that 
in my backyard. And, and so I, I do understand the predicament that they've been they've been put in. Now, there, there's some precedents for, for this. Some snowmobile associations have sued in the past. But do you know of, of any groups that have won? Uh, I don't. Uh, there's a case to be made that, I mean, the snow, Idaho State Snowmobile Association would have won their lawsuit if the Forest Service had not settled. In general, that's what a settlement indicates. And in this case, I think, uh, as I tried to show in the, in the chapter on Montana, um, that was likely as well. But no, I, I don't know any. So in the, the final chapter of, of your story in part four, you discuss a land access dis- dispute in, in Massachusetts. And, uh, you know, just can you give us a little bit of context for that? What happened in, in the Ware uh, River watershed? Yeah, it's tough. There's a lot of acronyms and all that, but I will give you a very basic encapsulation. Essentially, um, a bunch of mountain bikers in and around uh, a town called Rutland um, and some other towns as well. But closest to Rutland, we're riding this trail network for, let's say, 25, 30 years. And uh, it had been illegal since 1994 for them to ride in there on single track. They have access legally to roads. But it had uh, never been enforced. There were, I mean, I included in the story multiple quotes from state officials saying that they were aware and they did not care. And they never had a problem. And uh, one day, the wrong guy, the director... uh, of the Division of Water Supply Protection for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts found out. And, uh, you know, this is a guy who uh, I think showed some clear anti-mountain bike colors um, in the months uh, that followed. But he took it upon himself. This is a guy who manages 150 people. He took it upon himself to call this ride leader who had advertised a uh, group ride going into the Ware River watershed and came down on her pretty hard and, you know, kind of shit. We've, uh, we've seen basically, uh, the mountain bike access be completely eliminated other than on the gravel dirt roads in in that watershed and very, um, little even attempt to reason from the state, uh, the mountain bikers involved in the new England mountain bike association have really gone out of their way to be transparent and say, Hey, we understand there were some trails in there that weren't, um, weren't ever authorized or ever built sustainably. And let's get rid of those. Let's find those sustainable ones. Let's adopt them. We'll take care of them. You know, they were, they're willing to do anything. And, uh, yet, you know, the, uh, the folks who run this watershed are saying basically they're, they're, uh, spreading some propaganda. I, I think that that's clear. Um, uh, saying, nope, uh, mountain biking endangers the water supply for everyone in Boston who pays the rates for that water. And, uh, we're not gonna, we're not gonna budge. And yet this is while mountain biking was going on, this water that came out of that watershed in part, um, Boston's water won an award for being literally the best tasting water in America. So there's not a ton of, Um, factual basis, there's actually none that has been shown of factual basis that uh, mountain biking does endanger the water supply um, or really the watershed. And yet uh, these guys have been stonewalled and uh, they've had very little progress. Um, If they get someone to return an email from the state, it is kind of big news. And uh, it's been a, a tough road for them to have. And the the land manager kind of went a step further and they banned all users. So not just uh, mountain bikers, but equestrians, hikers, like nobody is now allowed in that area, correct? And that, uh, you're right, um, aside from a couple trails, but for the most part, yes. And that is strategic. Um, you know, if if all these other user groups, they're trying to prevent all the user groups, in my estimation, at least, they're trying to prevent all the user groups from uniting and saying, hey, we're the local residents here. We had these lands taken by eminent domain from our ancestors you know, a hundred years ago, and we want access to this land so we can recreate. And they're trying to, the state is consciously, I think, and, and probably successfully trying to prevent these other user groups, equestrians, uh, motorized and hiking and mountain biking from uniting in opposition to the state's policies. Yeah. And I think it's strange because when that happens, uh, most of the time I see the user groups unite but in in this situation the other user groups have kind of blamed mountain biking as being the reason why they're no longer allowed well that was because when they would find a trail closed a ranger would say they'd say why is this trail closed i've been i've been uh, riding my horse on this trail for 25 years and the ranger would say 
you can blame it on the mountain bikers. Wow. And so that, that was no coincidence. <laughs> Incredible. That debate, uh, you know, what's been circling around it among a lot of other things is it, it, it seems like it really centers on uh, the dispute that that mountain biking is more damaging than other user groups. And and I think every mountain biker's, you know, read at least one or two studies or, or a synopsis of a study that that says otherwise, that it's just uh, that any other user group is just as damaging as, as bikes, uh, if not mountain biking is actually less. But why do you think there's such an unwillingness for people to listen to, to scientific proof that's out there? Oh, you know, why, why, why do people deny climate change exists? It's a you know, you got your agenda in your brain. I don't think anything's going to sway you at some point. And that was why, you know, in that Massachusetts chapter, Philip Kies, who's the uh, director of New England Mountain Bike Association or executive director, said as much. He said, when we presented the science that their own agency abides by, because he was presenting this to the Division of Water Supply Protection, which is one half of, it's under the umbrella of, uh, the Department of Conservation and Recreation for the state of Massachusetts. So he was presenting it to the DWSP and saying, hey, the DCR, your guys' parent agency, has published the fact that they agree that hiking and mountain biking have similar impacts. And the DWSP was like, well, we have our own scientists. And, you know, what was he going to do? Say, but but the science is already there. I mean, what more can you say to that? that that's someone that really has no intention of listening to anything but what they want to believe. Do you have plans to do a, a follow-up with any of these stories? You know, uh, maybe. The, it created a little bit of a conversation on social media. And one point somebody brought up was, hey, you know, how about in a year you do one story that follows up on each location and just give us, because I agree, and I thought it was a great idea. Um, we're going to give access a rest for a little bit here. I think, yeah, the, a reader to know because so many stories like this it's like oh here's the shit's in the fan uh, check it out and then you just never know how it all ends up but i feel like there's a little bit of a postscript missing so i think we probably will look back on these three places and see if there's anything's changed basically well Devin, i just want to thank you for taking the time to to sit down and chat with me and i, I also want to say thank you for for writing these pieces and, and kind of highlighting some of the stuff that that's going on out there and and uh, i think it's good to to bring that to you know, the, the mainstream mountain bike media that's out there as well, which is always great. Cool. Thanks a lot, Brent. Like always, you can find the show on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Frontlines MTB. You can send me an email or audio file to frontlinesmtb at gmail.com. Don't forget to support the show via PayPal. You can find a link in the show notes, as well as links to Devin's Lines in the Dirt articles. As mentioned before, next episode will feature my full interview with Brandon Pack of the Ozark Off-Road Cyclists. We'll discuss some of the history of mountain biking in Arkansas, why you've suddenly been hearing about how great the riding is there, and just what role his club has had in making that happen. Following that, episode 20 will be hearing about two communities brought together by mountain biking in the Middle East. I'd also like to make a call out to anyone who has questions for my guest on episode 21. We'll be discussing branding, marketing, and public relations with the marketing chairperson of the Minnesota Off-Road Cyclists, Brandon Gallagher-Watson. So please send your questions by the end of June. And like always, music is by Lee Rosevere and production notes by Jennifer Pride. And finally, I'm Brent Hillier. This is Frontlines. Thanks for listening. And happy trails. <laughs>